success. I hope I learned some secrets why uh, I'm being able to moderate. My name is Warren Valentine. I'm a nationally syndicated radio host. I'm also an attorney. Uh, and I'm also doing what's called the People's Economic Movement right now uh, to try to change our communities across the country. We have a wonderful panel up here. And what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to let them introduce themselves because I probably wouldn't do the right justice by them that they deserve. Uh, I'm friends with a couple of people up here, other people I meet for the first time, but I'm very excited to have everybody here. So let's start off with Michelle right here, Michelle Singletary. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle Singletary. I write the syndicated column for the Washington Post called The Color of Money. Good afternoon, my name is Harriet Freeman, and I'm owner of H.E. Freeman Enterprises, which is a financial consulting company. I help clients get out of debt and increase their credit score, as well as develop good spending habits. I'm also the author of How to Get Out of Debt, Get an A Credit Rating for Free, and I also do financial literacy speaking to children as well as adults. And uh, the main thing that I try to get my clients to understand is that they need to know how much they earn, how much they spend, and how much they owe. So many times people go out, they don't know how much they earn, they don't know how much money they spend. And if you don't have accountability for your spending, you can't improve your financial life. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Eddie Brown, uh, founder, CEO, president, of the second oldest African American home investment management firm in the world, Crown Capital Management. And I'm aspiring to do what John Bo Bryan has done. And that is to have a top 10 best selling book. <laughs> <laughs> Beating the Odds, there are about 20 books with that title, so you have to go down to the subtitle when you go to Amazon.com. Eddie Brown's Investing and Life Strategies came out in May, uh, and I'm going to track John and try to get it to be a top 10 book. But my day job, uh, we manage a little over $4 billion of other people's money. I want to track you. <laughs> <laughs> now, and a little of our own, we do have uh, some 
very large clients, but we also have mutual funds that are open to well, general. Can everybody just stop for a minute? 40 years from the Dr. King, I have a dream, so we can even go in the bathroom. Wait a minute, my brother just said he made four billion dollars. <laughs> Doing this, doing it very well. We have uh, two of the top performing mutual funds in the United States: the Brown Capital Small Company Fund, the Brown Capital Mid Cap Fund. That's available to people with smaller sums that are minimum five billion dollars separate account and minimum for private uh, accounts. So that's me. That's pretty impressive. That's me. Let's go to Alvarosa. Alvarosa, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Omarosa Manigal, and I am a proud professor at the Howard University School of Business, where I teach branding and marketing in our MBA program. I am also very proud to announce that we are the first historically black college to have an executive MBA program. And um, it is a program that's completely online, where you don't have to give up your job to get an MBA. And so thus, we're providing an opportunity for professionals to advance their education. I also um, have a partnership with Donald Trump through Trump Productions. You may be seeing our, uh, our most popular show on TV One, which is called The Ultimate Merger. And also we have maybe two or three programs that you will be seeing thus forth. I also was on a show called The Apprentice, and I continue to do reality television programs throughout the world, and I am on my 35th. But prior to that, I worked in the White House for four years where I was Deputy Associate Director of Presidential Personnel. And before that, I worked for Bill and Camille Cosby at their National Visionary Leadership Project, overseeing their educational fund. And prior to that, my background is in corporate real estate. Oh, and I have a book called The Bitch Witch. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, you know it was going to be provocative if it came from me. Uh, I couldn't call it self-esteem for women, y'all wouldn't buy it, but I called it The Bitch Switch. <laughs> Knowing how to turn it on, turn it off is a award-winning book. We all aren't buying it. It's why women are lining up around the block to get the kind of attitude that we sisters have and how to effectively use it. And I did a second book with my mother. This is one of my love projects. My mother is an, uh, is an artist, and I wanted to give her an opportunity to show her art to the world. So for the last year, I've gotten a chance to work with my loving mother to publish her book, and that's my passion project. All right, give a round of applause for this panel. I, I think the, the proper place to start with this is understanding money. Uh, I know that, Michelle, this is something that you've been advocating forever, understanding and saving our money. Why is it so hard for us to understand budgeting and buy necessities instead of more? When you say us, you mean just black folks or America? I'm going to say America. I don't okay. want to just classify as black folks. It's other folks spending money. Right. Too. Um, I think that there's lots of pressure for all of us to spend our money. I mean, you turn on TV, the radio, wherever you go, there's lots of pressure for you to spend, buy, upgrade. I mean, you know, iPad 2s and, you know, all kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> so I think... She's always right. <laughs> something personal to me. I had every channel cable we had. And my cable bill was $400 a month. And I was home three days out of the month. Three days. So I started going through my budget. I was like, what do I do with it? So I, I, I got basic cable. As long as I got ESPN, I'm good. So, John, how early should we start talking about investing with our children? And, 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 and how 
how do we invest? A lot of us just don't know how to invest. The reason I'm hesitating is that you've asked a, a mouthful. Um, and you really didn't ask one question. You asked, um, you asked about 200 years worth of questions. Um, this is not about money. Uh, what people don't understand is money's emotion. Um, money is also aspiration. Money ties into your self-esteem directly, like you plug something in a wall. So when I was growing up in Compton, California, South Central LA, um, Andrew Young, Patrick, one of my mentors, says that men fail for three reasons, arrogance, pride, and greed. That's not a lack of financial literacy. That's not a lack of knowledge. Everybody in here knows somebody who's in financial trouble, right? I'm sorry, am I talking to myself? Can I get an amen? Amen. So, and by the way, we need to be able to have this conversation and be able to say that without the shame. That's the other problem. Half of those in foreclosure today never called their lender. It wasn't that the lender gave you a bad answer. We just never called. That's shame. We're ashamed to admit that we don't get it. And we think if we keep driving the car to work, the car we can't afford, it, the payments in which we are behind on, if we keep going to work, if we keep going shopping, keep going to restaurants, that this will just go away. The story will change, the page will turn. This is not a soap opera, it's not a movie, it's your life. And just because you don't open the mail doesn't mean the mail's not opening you. So part of this is shame, which ties into low self-esteem. And so when I was growing up, I remember my mother teaching me there's a difference between, between being broke and being poor. That being broke is economic, but being poor is a disabling frame of mind and a depressed condition of your spirit, and you must vow never to be poor again. Or to translate it into spiritual talk, my dad, my pastor, who I play Father Reverend Murray would say, is not what people call you, is what you answer to that's important. And never answer out of your name. We've been answering out of our name for a very long time. And to argue with a fool proves there are two. We've been arguing with fools for a very long time. I just look at people like they're crazy. I don't get an argument. You, you just look at, I just look at you like you're nuts and keep on moving. But it, but most people can't do that. They feel they feel like they want to be liked. Or, you know, like me, don't like me, that's fine. Respect me, learn to like me versus liking me and then hopefully respecting me. So we are a people who are more poor than we are broke. And so that's why when you measure financial literacy, most of these things say that financial literacy doesn't work. Because it's left brain, left brain. It's like going to a math class. You want to put a kid to sleep, give him a financial literacy course. Nobody wants a mortgage, you want to become a homeowner. Nobody wants a mortgage and say, ooh, give me a subprime 20% interest mortgage with 20 points. Nobody in their right mind does that. Nobody wants a car loan. Ooh, give me one of those red 15% interest car loans. They want a cool car. Nobody wants an education, really, other than academic. They want aspiration. They want to be successful. So we've disconnected education from aspiration. We've disconnected self-esteem, self-worth, and self-love from the conversation of getting rich. In fact, we should be talking about wealth and not riches. Because wealth is inside out, but riches is outside on. And if your ass is on your ass, you've already got another problem. So I don't have a problem with the cell phone. Because when I go to Africa, which I was there two weeks ago, we have an office there, everybody's got cell phones. It's actually a good sign. I mean, Africa will probably be the first wireless continent. And by the way, basically what I'm saying in South Africa, we have been, for the last 50 years, the richest, most well-educated, most well-prepared group of black people on the planet. African Americans in North America. That is not guaranteed. You go to South Africa and you, your mouth will drop. These folks are taking no prisoners. They, and and it, makes you, it makes you proud, if not for making us sad, but on our own plight. So I think mean, it's how they're using that cell phone. They may not have running water, <laughs> they may not have a, a paved road, but they are hustling. From KC in the morning to the KC at night, there is no welfare. So I think that I'm really suggesting this is a larger 
issue. While we can't keep getting our hands around it, it's a larger issue. When I teach financial literacy, I do two things. One, I first teach a course in dignity. Because wealth is inside out, not outside only. Number two, I make sure a volunteer goes in that classroom and looks like her, or looks like you, or looks like him. Suit it and boom it. Quincy Jones says it takes 20 years to change a culture. In the last 20 years, we've made dumb sexy. <laughs> we've dumbed down and celebrated. And now we've got to make smart sexy again. So when the little girl sees you, yeah, you're talking about financial literacy and telling her the language of money. I call it language of money, by the way, not financial literacy. And I'm now calling it financial dignity, not even financial literacy. Even though Bob Richo got the president to sign into the board of making financial literacy U.S. policy, I've now thrown away my own term. term but I don't believe it illustrates it enough. I think right brain, left brain is financial dignity. But that little girl is yes, she's getting that course, but by the second one-hour session, the little girl saying, "I can be you." The minute the little girl says, the endorphins start firing, and she says, I can be you, you've eradicated poverty. I'm not sure if that translates it perfectly. The minute the young, the young black man sees you in a suit with a business card, and the little brother says, damn, I can be you. How'd you get rich legally? Because our, last point, our kids want to be rap stars, athletes, and drug dealers. You know, I think I also want to weigh in. Let me just finish my sentence. I know I, 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 I don't speak any more of this panel. It's fine. Let me just, I said what I want to say. But that little kid wants to be a rap star, athlete, and drug dealer. You, uh, you go do a survey in our urban America. Rap stars, athletes, and drug dealers. I used to believe that I grew up in the hood, that that kid was dumb and stupid. Now I realize that kid's brilliant. Because that kid is modeling what he sees. This is what tells me we can solve this problem. Give the kids something different to see. Well, I, I was actually going to uh, really stress on the point that you said about financial literally, uh, literacy. I'll stick to the term that you all taught in my class. When I had Operation Hope and John's team came to Howard University, you would think these MBA students wouldn't have an epiphany. When I first told them that they were coming, they grumbled. Uh, we don't need that, we're MBA candidates. Yet our session lasts, I think, five hours. The students couldn't get enough because it occurred to them that they would be graduating into debt if they didn't pay attention to what was being taught. And these were some really basic principles. So if there was a way, and I know that you all are doing that and I'm teaming up with you all to do that, to take that program and make it available because folks aren't seeking it out. But throughout our communities, whether it's in churches, whether it's in, in elementary schools, junior high schools, even my students had more questions and more questions and more questions and I referred them to the Hope Centers because it starts with educating yourselves and re-educating yourselves about how we think about money. I made a point in my book and on The Apprentice that we as black folk don't talk about salaries. We, we, we won't say to you, well, how much did you make? How, how much is your salary? Because I'm, you're not going to tell me, but I'm going to tell you there's a different, there's a different culture because the white was like, well, I, when I worked in that position, I got 75,000. You should ask him for a bump and a membership to the club because that's how they talk. They don't mind sharing that information. And so the lack of dissemination of information is, is really problematic in our communities because we don't talk about what we make, right? We were taught to keep that to ourselves. Well, you should keep your salary to yourself. You should talk about it. No, no, no. I, I disagree. I disagree because I'm teaching my students that before they go for that position, you need to know what the person before you was making. And what that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about my point about my students being armed with information to make educated financial decisions. And they can do that by lo looking at this program that John has created because it is so effective. And if you have a chance and if you take nothing else, I'm actually endorsing that program because my students were profoundly changed by the fact that they found out that they knew nothing. So it's two things that we've gotten already, right? John brought up an excellent point. Show these children something else. And I've also just brought up a great point. Let's have an open discussion about what we want when we talk about financial literacy. Your, your, your kids think that your lights come on all by themselves. <laughs> your, your, your kids think the lights come on by themselves, the phone works. I mean, you, you disconnect the phone. Watch. Mama, what's wrong with this phone? The kids think that the internet is part of a computer. If, the, if there's no internet, they don't get the computers working. These are presumptions and assumptions based on ignorance. 
and based on entitlement. I hate to say it. We have a whole entitlement generation. You would just expect things to be the way they are. Now, the way you are, you worked. You hustled. Before, before we go any further, I got to introduce uh, my president. He's the president of the National Urban League. He's the former mayor of New Orleans, my oh. friend, my mentor. Oh. Fun Morial, give him a round of applause. You know, I want to bring I want to bring Dr. Malvo in here because it's something very important. Because we're talking about the, the younger generation, you deal with and you help cultivate all these beautiful women at Bennett College who are going to be great leaders and scholars in this country. What's the most important thing you want them to get out of economic development from Bennett? Well, at Bennett, we require students to take an intro to entrepreneurship class. We have four, four foci in my administration: entrepreneurship, leadership, global studies, and communication. We got four new buildings in my four years as president. One is a new global learning center uh, where our entrepreneurship center and our center for global studies are housed. So we want students to understand that they can be not only high achievers, they can bring the highest and best, their A to the game, which means that they must know that this economy will not always generate jobs for them. This economy right now, African American unemployment rate 29.3%. So not the 16.7 that you read about somewhere, but 29.3%. So if you understand that, you understand that you have to use the ingenuity that is implicit to us as black people to create opportunities for yourself. Because you, the culture of taking a job, having that job for 40 years, getting the gold watch when you finish the 40 years, that's over. That's finished. You, if you're lucky, you may have five, six, or seven jobs in the course of your lifetime. If you're unlucky, you may have 10, 12, or 15 jobs plus periods of idleness. Uh, we were just in a session over at the Book Pavilion where a woman talked about the cap on public assistance in five years. Yep. After that, she will not get cash. And so if, if, if there has been a culture of dependency, I would argue that, but if there has been one, it's over. But people have to understand that they have to create opportunities for themselves. So the hustle thing that John pointed out in South Africa, the hustle thing that we see in other parts of the world, is the hustle thing, clean hustle, not dirty hustle, clean hustle that we need to have. These, I'm going to ask my business students to stand so you can see these lovely young women. Thank you. Among them is the Student uh, Government Association President, the Senior Class President, both of whom have traveled internationally. Herschel spoke to Ghana and to Copenhagen, accompanied me to COP15. Uh, Danielle to Ghana uh, last semester, or last spring, last fall actually. Uh, they spent an interesting uh, semester in Ghana. And one of the things we say global studies, it's our goal to make sure that our women have exposure to the world. Because when you have exposure to the world, you see yourself very differently. As African American people, we like to think it began and end, ended here. You know, but we have this little 400 year history that includes our history as enslaved people. But that's been sufficient and it minimizes it. But look at us from a global perspective, there's so much more. Or I want to uh, locate myself somewhere in the middle of these two sisters about the salary business. I believe that, you know, the people in America will more readily tell you how many times they last had sex than they will have an open discussion about money. Yep. You can turn on the television and people say, I'll tell you what they did, how they did it, who they did it with, and in what position. That's too much <laughs>
is because of the uh, administrative assistant who got mad at the director, who was a crazy man and used racial slurs all the time, left my relative the payroll of everybody on her desk. Wow. Not. And so then she was able to see that literally she was making 50, for this white guy who reported to her was making $50,000 more than she was. And she was, she was able, she sued, she got about five years pay. At some point she used her big sister card. Oh, I don't think it was, oh, I'm sorry. Um, turn that off the table. <laughs> you know, my sister, my sister studies, my sister studies employment discrimination and she could be an expert witness. Next thing you know, she had to sign some agreement that she would tell me what the settlement was. I said, don't tell me, write on a piece of paper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but so the information needs to be shared because that's the only way we learn about this discrimination. We, now, all, into all your business, I mean, we have a culture of keep your business to yourself. No, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. I mean, the, the, the idea is that you, ne you can't focus on individually what people make. Because my grandmother never made more than $13,000 a year, and yet she had more money when she retired than people I work with who make six-figure salaries. That's what I mean. This whole, this whole focus on what you make. You can make 100000 and be broke and make 20000 and have a lot of money. That's what I mean. That when you talk about building wealth and, and financial education, it's how you may do with what you have wherever you are, whether you're a teacher. So, I mean, I believe that you ought to operate in your gifts. So when we say things like everybody should be this, that's wrong. Some people are born to be teachers. What I like to do is teach you how to live on that teacher's salary so that you're not aspiring to spend more than your salary can do. That's what I want you know, to I, I say. This. I, want to bring, I want to bring Mark in on this conversation. And I want to bring Mark in on, on this part of the conversation because one of the things that I'm hearing uh, from, from everybody, and, and I think, uh, Dr. Malvo, you, 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 what you're doing at Bennett is unbelievable because whenever you start talking about entrepreneurship, that is something that we desperately need right, right. in our community, more so than anything else. We yes. need to be having multiple streams of income. And I know the Urban League is at the forefront uh, of creating entrepreneurship and pushing the government to give kids opportunities for, for jobs and other things to become young entrepreneurs. Well, you know, first of all, it's just great to be here. I apologize for arriving late. I'm on the uh, Department of Education's Equity Commission. And I had to be in the room, if you know what I mean, oh, yeah. uh, for that discussion. And it kind of got heated and hot in a very good way. But let me just say this, Warren, and to everyone. And it's just great to sit here and listen because I'm learning uh, from all of you and uh, your sharing. Uh, when I joined the National Urban League uh, eight years ago, we really didn't have a concerted effort around entrepreneurship. In that eight-year period, we had opened nine entrepreneurship centers. These are one-stop shops that provide coaching, counseling, uh, and free consulting services, if you will, uh, to entrepreneurs in nine communities. One is Philadelphia, Stand Up Pack. Patricia Coulter, the president of the Philadelphia Urban League, is here, and she runs the Philadelphia Sitting next to is J. Howard Henderson. J. Howard Henderson, president of the Baltimore Urban League, uh, has worked for the last uh, several years with Johns Hopkins University doing the minority business monitoring uh, of their new developments in East Baltimore. Uh, at present, the National Urban League and its affiliates serve approximately 6,000 small businesses each and every year through centers that are funded with private dollars. Private dollars, not a dime of government work, dollars. Imagine what we could do if we had some support from the federal government, we could expand, indeed, what we do. One thing that is so important is to understand that in the last decade, the number of African-American-owned businesses has increased dramatically. Uh, the number of African-American-owned businesses has increased greater than that of mainstream businesses. That's good news. Secondly, the revenue increase for African-American businesses has outpaced that of the mainstream. That is also good news. On the other hand, for African-American-owned businesses, only 10 to 15 percent have more than one employee. So many people, apropos to the hustle, 
uh, are involved in entrepreneurship in addition to holding down uh, a full-time job, in addition to doing a number of other things. Uh, we have to focus on, we have to concentrate on this. You know, it's interesting living in the Northeast because if you look, for example, at uh, the Dunkin' Donuts franchise, and I don't know how many of you frequent those, I do from time to time, uh, East Asians, Indian Americans, uh, have, uh, have a powerful footprint inside that franchise space. Why am I saying that? Uh, because entrepreneurship also requires sacrifice. Uh, long hours, being in love with a business, financial sacrifice, not because you own a business, you're gonna live big, or you're gonna live high, uh, and it takes a long time to do it. So we do have to continue to focus uh, on entrepreneurship uh, and continue to focus on building it. Just at the National Urban League, we just realized that as an organization that for 100 years has tried to help people find jobs, uh, I said it's time for us to create some jobs. Uh, and one way to create jobs is to create businesses in our own community. The one thing we all need to do is we need to be much more conscious of where we spend our dollars. We have to be conscious to think about where we spend our dollars. And I think there's two rules. I think we ought to try to spend money with businesses that are in our community, African American owned, and I think we need to spend money with mainstream businesses that have a presence and a commitment uh, to our community. We can vote with our dollars. Our spending power is nearing one trillion dollars. I believe it would make us about ninth or tenth if we were an independent nation. We as a community are not broke. We as a community are not poor. We as a community have to get more wise and intelligent about how we harness uh, our power as consumers to build. And so Warren has done something, I don't know if you've talked about it, and that is trying to generate more support for community-based and African-American banks through savings accounts, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a yeah, whole this, this lot that we can do. They, they put over a million dollars in uh, one bank and they put money in other banks. And uh, next week, we're actually kicking off, uh, I'm getting 30,000 listeners to make a pledge of $30 a month that they're gonna put up, put up and we're gonna take $900,000 a month and put it back into the communities that the station is in to market across the country and, and put it back into the banks in the community so that we can have money and capital to create entrepreneurship, to create home ownership, to create education. One of the things that, that to me, that is, is, is deadly missing in, in this conversation as far as uh, understanding money is the cost of education in this country. And Dr. Malvo, we've been on panels where, we, where you've heard me say this before, where these kids are getting so undereducated that even when they graduate from high school, that first year of college, they're just taking remedial classes and they have to pay for it. They're getting an extra year of debt on them as they go through school. We, we, we look at what's going on in our community, and as Mark has said, and as John has said, and as, as many of you will agree, we're not poor in our community, we're just not focused. We're not focusing our money at all. Let me talk a minute about this college cost thing because I think it really is extremely important. I was looking at your column, Michelle, the other week. You told the people don't go in their retirement funds and pay for the students' college. And someone wrote a letter disagreeing with you. I think, again, it's something that has to be balanced. But here's what we know. Someone who goes to college and graduates from college will earn about a million dollars more than someone who does not. Even one of the few things that you ought to spend money on. Now, you know, all these consumer goods, you need a new car. No, you don't need a new car. You want a new car. But you do need higher education. And so if you go into debt to finance your education, that's fine. What I want students to do is to go into debt prudently. Right. And when they have the so-called refund checks, at better we call them net loan proceeds, not refunds. Because taking out a loan and getting money back is not a refund. There's something you have to pay back. So, you know, I've seen not only at my campus, other campuses, young women who, um, they're waiting for their refund checks so they can go purchase clothes. Well, that's a poor use of dollars that you have to spend to pay interest on. Or, more tragically, in what's happening in our community, young women who take out more loans than they need to because their parents need money. And that, that is that your parents need to say, okay, let's draw a line here. So, intergenerationally, there's some real challenges. But from a policy perspective, 
I really wonder why our young people pay 6% interest on their student loans, but large banks are paying 1% interest on their right. borrowing right. from the federal right. government. I really right. want to understand why in the middle of a recession, and it is a recession, it might be a double dip recession, our young people are being challenged to pay their loans back 18, 12 to 18 months after they graduate, but when the black unemployment rate is 30%, why we can't push that repayment period back to two years or even three years. I, I really want to figure out why we're looking at cutting student loan money, cutting Title III money, which comes in historically black colleges, and cutting other kinds of money when um, we know how vital these HBCUs are. Now, what you say is absolutely true about the students who come unprepared and underprepared, and part of that, as you said, has to do with the racism that exists in urban public education. True story, first year at Bennett, I don't get to do this anymore, I still do, but I don't do it that often. Man, a preacher came to my office with three girls in a pickup truck. He heard me say on television, I could turn anybody into a scholar. That convinced me almost to stop talking. Because <laughs> <laughs> that guy could get me into trouble every time. So he had three young ladies who wanted to come to college. Now, two of them had graduated, one disappeared. But one of the two girls had a 1.9 GPA. I said, how did, and, 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 I said, honey, how did you get, oh, I mean, this to me defies logic. How did you get a 1.9? What did you do or not do? Anyway, she, you know, asked her cash to be excused, and her story was that the chemistry teacher at her Virginia public high school would fondle the girls as they left the room, so she stopped going to the class. And she was very trapped. She said, I'll, I'll admit it, my sophomore year, I was screw up. My mother remarried, and I was bad. You know, her dad died, and mother, she was bad. She said, but, she said, I, when I complained, they told me that I was just a troublemaker. And they did, she said, I just stopped going to the class, so I took the abs. I said to her, don't make me put my credibility on the line. I will let you in if you have some money, A, and B, if you apply yourself. I want to see a B average at the end of the semester. Girl graduated with 3.4. That's what's up. So you know, that's, um, I, I don't believe that any of our young people can't learn, but I believe we, many of them don't have study skills. We have to be able to teach them how to apply themselves. But right now, the federal government is working against our young people and when their parents are have, have low incomes, and you know the average income for black families right now is thirty-two thousand dollars compared to forty-nine thousand dollars for white families. Well, what can you do with thirty-two thousand dollars? I keep trying to figure that out. But anyway, when the income is thirty-two thousand um, dollars, they're not likely to qualify for a lot of the loans that are available. So how do they really do that? So I, you know, I know that I hijacked for a minute, but my plea to you all, from a policy perspective, Mark, I'm glad you were in that meeting. Uh, where, where you were, because we need your voice there. Not enough of us are on those Department of Education panels, and I'm not gonna say something else that I was gonna say, I'll leave it alone for the moment. But in any case, from a policy perspective, we need to urge our Congress people and our president to put more money into HBCUs. We need to urge our Congress people and our president to make these loan terms more affordable for our young people. And we've done it for everybody else, but we haven't done it for young people. Basically, get money, just put your hand out if you get it. But our young people who are our, our future are not getting it. We see data all the time that young people will do worse than their parents did. And that's partially because when I graduated from college, I had exactly $2,000 in student loan. Now, I get graduated from college in the dark age. You know, I mean, we didn't have internet. You know, I don't even know how I wrote my doctoral dissertation. I have punch cards. You know, wow. no, no internet punch cards. Put the punch cards in, I had to put my telephone in the side of the computer. And the whole telephone the side of the computer. Oh, it was really deep. Um, but anyway, this is back in the day. If you lost a page, you just had to pray. You know, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't have it saved and no word process and any of that stuff. Oh, it was a dark age. But in any case, you know, when I graduated, $2,000 worth of loans. Now the average college student graduates with $23,000 worth of loans, and the average black college student with $28,000 worth of loans. So y'all have work to do. You come here to talk about managing money. Let's look at this new generation. Let's talk about ways through public policy we can help them. And I would, I would piggyback by saying this. How many of you went to HBCUs in here? Raise your hand. Raise your hand you went to HBCU. How many of you write checks every year to that HBCU? Be honest. See, I write a lot of checks to North Carolina ENT. I should have a bus up there by now. <laughs> well, you should write one for Bennett, and let me tell you all something. <laughs> Those of you who did not graduate from HBCUs need to adopt one. That's right. So that's right. A few dollars every month. Yeah, just, right. just adopt one. Pick a good, 
take a, you know, Bennett should be your preferred form of adoption, but I don't know. If you live in Delaware, you might want to make a Delaware state. You know, if you want to lift up Dr. King, you might, might want to make it Morehouse. On the other hand, for my Spelman sisters, Bennett is the sister school of Morehouse. You know, I want to bring, I want to bring in, in, in you know, you, you manage four billion dollars. You know, it's hard for most of us in this room to imagine four billion dollars. How do we get into that kind of investment? We need to learn how to do that. Okay, but before I do that, let me just say, first of all, that I operate from the lowest end of the spectrum to the highest end of the spectrum. And I'm so pleased that many of the black churches are adding financial literacy centers. I was approached by the senior pastor of Ebenezer in Atlanta, Reverend Raphael Warnock, used to be my pastor in Baltimore. And he asked for a huge check to start this financial literacy uh, center. And of course, we agreed to do that. You know, we have, in my family, some very uneducated people. We have some people in my family with serious financial problems. One relative came to us a few years ago who was having difficulty paying their bills, and they were in serious default on their mortgage and everything else. This was before the financial crisis. And I said, you know, let's take a look at your budget. And they said, budget? And that seems to be systemic among many uneducated, poor, uh, poor people. So we started with, you know, income, you know, the basics. And I said, no, I need to know after-tax income. And then we went down the list and we made up a budget. And I said, well, it's, you know, very obvious why you're having trouble. Your expenses exceed your income. They're tithing to their church at 10% of gross income. And I said, but you don't have gross income to spend. You only have after-tax income. So we started going through, you know, and basically coming into reality. But that seems to be kind of a common problem is that many people don't have a budget. They don't know how much money they have after tax take home. They don't really know what their expenditures are. So therefore it's very easy to get out of line. And that's just kind of basic. At the other end, uh, Amorosa, you said you're at Howard Business yes. School? Yes, I am. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So maybe five years or so ago, we said, okay, let's do something in the business school. By the way, I got my engineering degree, undergraduate at Howard University. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you right there. Well, I'm I'll tell you what. No, 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 seriously, about five years ago, we wrote a check for $250,000. And the purpose of that check was not just to write a check to Harvard University. We wrote the check to the business school where Amorosa teaches. And if you go down into the trading room at the business school at Howard University, you will see a sign that should say, it did say, I hope it's still there, after a check. <laughs> Now, I don't know whether they have Goldman Sachs slash Brown Capital or Brown Capital slash Goldman Sachs trading room. Uh, I think it's Brown Capital, Goldman Sachs. There's a trading room for the students to get familiar with Wall Street. We endowed a financial lecture series. Supposedly, every semester, they have a titan from Wall Street come to campus, spend time on campus with the students, to expose them to Wall Street. They're supposed to have an investment fund. So a certain amount of money, live, real money, but they have to do presentations, research on companies, basically to get them familiar with the real world capitalistic system in an active way. So, you know, we're gonna be a little pushed for time. They, they, they're telling me we need to take questions from the audience, so. I'm going to let you wrap up, and I want to ask Ms. Freeman a question about credit, and then take questions from the audience. Okay, let me wrap up by saying my passion is entrepreneurship. 
Mark talked about the importance of entrepreneurship. I think that is the way to help our people, our race, uh, succeed. So I'm very passionate about that. But what I found is that many black businesses fail for the same reason that the relative that I talked about were, was having financial difficulties. They let fancy office space, all of the trappings of success early on in the development of the business get in the way of some basics. And that is that income has to exceed expenses or the business is not going to survive. I can talk all day about entrepreneurship, but I will stop there, but that is the key to the future of our people. That's, Ms. Freeman, I want to bring you in here too right quick. If you haven't had a chance to speak, you, you deal with credit, and that's so important because I just remember being a, a freshman in college, getting every credit card I thought I was <laughs> without having a job, no understanding that I was going to be messing my credit up and anything else. You know, how do we... How important is it for us to pay close attention to our children's credit and our own credit in today's society? That is a great question, and it is very important. Um, I came from a family of entrepreneurs. I knew about savings. I had a savings account, but I got into debt when I went to college. And by the time I was a senior, I had 13 credit cards. I was $19,000 in debt. When I graduated, I got a job making 21000 So you can see I had a financial crisis at an early age. And um, I learned the hard way about debt. I learned about you know, how ruthless the creditors can be. Um, I learned about the laws that protect consumers. And so I was able to pass that advice on to others. But what I would say is that credit is so important nowadays. Everyone looks at your credit if you're trying to buy a house, if you're trying to buy a car, if you're trying to get a job. And you get have to- <laughs> get insurance, and you have to you have to educate yourself. We can no longer sit back and be paralyzed by fear and put our head in the sand. We have to take action if if we want to improve our lives, and especially in our in our neighborhoods, and especially across the country, we have to make a change because we will continue to be in this never-ending cycle of being um, the last ones promoted for jobs, being the last ones to become homeowners, being the last ones to have good credit. These are not things that are unattainable. They can be attained, but we have to put in the hard work, the sacrifice, give the knowledge, surround yourself with education, come to families like this, surround yourself with a support network, role models of people who are who are financially savvy. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. Brown is successful in that. You know, talk to people, get advice, empower yourself so that you can change your life and, and change the lives of your children. And you have to start with them as, as soon as they begin talking. As soon as they can talk, then you need to talk to them about money. Educate them about the value of the dollar. Educate them about credit. Sometimes parents don't want to teach their children you know, that they're having a financial crisis so they can't pay a bill. And then the children grow up and think that money grows on trees. And so they, when they experience that crisis, they don't know how to handle it. So we have to empower them with the knowledge, with the tools, so that they can grow into a responsible, fiscally savvy adult. Well, if you have questions, raise your hand. We're going to send anybody out. You can take your questions. John, I know you wanted to say something before we get your questions. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Uh, first of all, I think that of everything I've heard, she said the wisest, most amazing thing of the afternoon. Thank you for your comments. Um, um, it's interesting, sir. Uh, we've never met, I don't think. Um, this is truly God's. This is just all God. Coincidence. God's G, uh, Ambassador Young says coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. So I, I agreed to build a Hope Financial Literacy Empowerment Center on the hollow ground of the King Center wow. at Ebenezer Church. Wow. Little did I know, I mean, I'm just putting a chill down my spine. Little did I know that, that was going to allow Reverend Raphael Warnock to go to a hero in our community and get him to write a check. And I, and it, and I, didn't, I remember Reverend Raphael Warnock telling me this. He told me that the amount, I'm not going to embarrass him, it was a big check. Um, but that check then allowed Raphael Warnock to go to Coca-Cola, which then wrote another check to match him. Isn't God good? Now, this money didn't go to me. It went to the church, and that's perfect. We have not, we, this is not about competition. This is all boats rise. The, the beauty of Dr. King was creating an ecosystem where civil rights was respected. And, and to, to sit here and to, to, to know that you've made that investment and you I mean, you just did it was the right thing to do. And it created the church a way to, to lock you into their movement and make Dr. King relevant in the 21st century. Man, I'm a, I'm, 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 I'm a so, uh, And on, on uh, the HBCU piece, I just want to say that we are, we do have a college program. We are on 20 
campuses. We are pushing philanthropy as well as financial literacy uh, because most of our HBCUs live hand to mouth uh, with tuition. And what we're saying is every college student put a dollar a month up in the four years you're there. If the average college campus would, co would collect $36,000, that check is delivered to the president at graduation from that class as a symbol of giving back for that class. And what that does is create a spirit of philanthropy for generations to come so that you have getting the habit of giving back to your HBCU. And here's the point for everybody to, to walk away from. One out of four Americans today, read black and brown people, uh, do not get EITC. The earning of tax credit, $9 billion goes back to the federal government every year. One out of four people, you and me, don't get collected now. If you work and you make less than $49,000 a year, the governor owes you money. If you have two children and you make $25,000 a year at the post office or wherever, the governor owes you $4,000 a year. If you've never filed, it's retroactive for three years. That's $12,000. You amend your tax returns, file tomorrow, within a month, you have $12,000 in your bank account. You pay your tuition here for your kids in school. Yeah. Yeah, may I say one last thing before we close, because this is just really a small world story. The reason my wife and I were in Atlanta in June was to really go to receive an award at the Black Enterprise Entrepreneurs Conference that was held for several days. Derek Dingle was sitting over there, senior editor, Black Enterprise, and stand there. And they called me, kind of two coincidences, I asked Earl Graves Sr. to be an endorser on the back cover of my book, which he agreed to do. No connection, but they said they wanted me to come to Atlanta because they were going to award me their highest award for an African American business person, which is the A.G. Gaston Award, the Lifetime Achievement, um, you know, kind of recognizing this is a lot of illustrious group of people on that list over the past decade. I don't know how I got that award. But brings it to Ebenezer, Reverend Warnock. I called Reverend Warnock, as I said, he was our former pastor for five years in Baltimore. And I said, we've been in Atlanta for the Black Enterprise Entrepreneurs Conference, and I was wondering if there's any way that I could do a book signing at Ebenezer. He said, sure. He said, if you come the Sunday before, the 11 o'clock service is the highest attendance, I will make the connection at the end of the service. I will give you the mic for three minutes, and I will tell him you will be outside to do a book signing. However, about a half hour before the service, he invited my wife and I into his office. And he talked about this financial literacy center that was going to be built right next door, right on the grounds of the church. And he said, I would like for you and your wife to basically provide some stimulation. So we decided to do it. So we said, we will be the capstone gift, you know, six-figure type number, if you can get someone else to step up. So within, I think, a week or two, he got, was it Coca-Cola? Coca -Cola. And they were there. Isn't God good? Uh, thanks for the question. Hi, I'm Ron Burke, the Washington Informer newspaper, and uh, I think everybody in this panel knows the Washington Informer newspaper, maybe with the exception of you, and the work that we do in uh, putting financial literacy out into the community. As a matter of fact, we're doing our annual financial literacy special section uh, coming up in two weeks on October 13th, and I'm a proud Hampton man, and I do write checks. Okay. One of the questions I want to ask, you know, with so many people that are unemployed right now, I, I sell advertising for the Informer. I'm getting more and more people calling me wanting to place ads in the paper for network marketing, you know, because they've lost their job and now they're into prepaid legal or FDI or, you know, it doesn't matter. But the network marketing, I'd like to get the panel's uh, feedback on what they think of network marketing, because I can, seriously, they are entrepreneurs, but it doesn't work for everybody. I just want to see what you guys think about the network marketing thing. You know, it's, it's growing. Um, I'll respond to that. I, I'm very interested in teaching people about sustainable wealth, about wealth that lasts for a long time. If you can just show me 10 people who have made a lot of money and sustained that wealth, then that, that's something I would endorse. But unfortunately, I don't see those people. I see them make a flash a lot of money, and then it dwindles, but they cannot sustain it. And so that's not something that 
I would ever endorse. You know, I think that the network marketing um, has extremely limited opportunities. The person who makes the money is the person who started the network. Because all the portions will go to them always. You, everybody in this room has a network, but, every, but people's networks are limited. So generally the way this works, I sell to two, and the two then sell to four, and at some point you run out of people. You know, and so it, it just seems to me that take that money and use it for something else. Because you're gonna have to invest something, so I'm saying take the money and use it for something else. Save your money over time. If you wanna do something with friends, part, you know, pool your money to start a business. Uh, there are so many opportunities out there. I mean, the thing about, you know, some people are making money off this recession. This is what millionaires are created, though. I mean, that's what people felt This is the time This is the time. time. This is right. the time. Everything, everything is doing. You, you could literally, if everybody in this room today said, okay, we're going to all put up $5,000. People go to the city. Buy a house at a trade department. Go to the city. And you can pretend to be. Up. 
If you're in debt, your credit messed up already. Yes, sir, that's it.
well. I think the last thing is, is that I don't know if they're being told that with that BK thing that you were talking about, two years after BK and three years after foreclosure, they can actually be homeowners again. Yes, that's exactly right. That's a that's first time home buyer. That's, that's exactly that's right. what they need to And, and I'm going to tell you, when you talk about this from a legislative point of view, and, and I, I, I was supposed to be on the last panel, and I came in here very late because I had a meeting with the president. And one of the things that I was talking to him about, because he's from Illinois, because he's from Chicago, and because he is an attorney like myself, we were talking about the modification of the bankruptcy laws. Because right now, I can go in and you own a home and you have three investment properties, a boat, a yacht, whatever. I can go in and strip down the price of those investment homes and that yacht to what it's worth today. So even if you got a million dollar contract, if it's only worth $50,000, guess what? You only own $50,000. But I can't do that with your primary residence where you live in. And the reason the law is like that is because, you know what? Only the rich folks will have investment properties and yachts and everything like that. It's the poor people who need to be able to get their mortgages remodified in the bankruptcy code. And that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is when, when you think about what's happening in this country, there's a lot of legislative stuff that could be addressed from an educational point of view, from a, a bankruptcy point of view, and from a consumer point of view that could save individual homes and, 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 and save our communities. But until we organize and start making our voices heard and let them understand that we do understand legislation and that we're not just going to vote, that's when we'll see the change and start really starting. In the interest of time, I'll ask the last question. Uh, Wait, no, no, no. This is to Ms. Vincent. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. We really need to address it. Thank you. <laughs> the panel has been excellent, and mine is really just a comment, and I am going to go to work. Uh, to Mr. Bryant, I'm with the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, and I'm a realtor. We're all in this family. You have provided for our organization. We have a youth academy of um, entrepreneurship and mentorship that you've been doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And your organization, I now know why you're so blessed, because you give so much. And I want you to be a part of that. They were in New Orleans, we have pictures, you probably have seen them. We did a Habitat for Humanity so they could see what service is all about and the education. And it's so, topic, I know, uh, the guy from the Lionel. Lionel, it's Habitat. With like that, it's all taken care of for us, so I wanted to personally thank you. And for all of you on the panel, real estate, all the things you're talking about is what our organization does. We're now starting to focus more regionally, and of course, we're concerned about what's going on in the community. So I'm going to extend an invitation to all of you to work with us as we focus more on the community, on the ground, and our programs and initiatives. I'll give you all my cards, and I'll be reaching out to you to find some ways for you guys to support us and help us on the ground as we move across the country. Thank you. Before we close, let me ask your last question, because I'm going to have to sneak out. If you have questions about the Executive MBA program at Howard that I described, my Facebook is just facebook.com backslash Omarosa, and I'm on Twitter. Twitter.com backslash Omarosa, and I will send you that information. We have funding so that we can take care. Of, I believe that they're providing several scholarships for people who have been in the workforce. I just wanted to tell you. Um, in closing, Brother Mark Morio discussed uh, discussed the fact that African Americans are at the top of the list with, it, with respect to consumerism, and he also talked about reinvesting in our neighborhoods. Yet. It's almost a conflict of interest, right, because we're talking about saving and actually keeping our dollars in our pocket. Can you explain the, the, the paradigm and how to kind of sift through that and what you mean by investing in our neighborhoods but also being accountable for the finances that you do have and not overspending? I think what he was saying, for example, if you've got to do some home project on your house, one of the things my husband and I do is that we get bids, because that's the smart thing to do, get bids. So we make sure that we include an African-American person in that bid process. Every time we've done that, they've actually won our business. So we have to come in, they do an assessment, and almost 100% of the time, we've chosen an African American person. The thing is, you have to do both. You have to save, and then you have to invest. If you don't save, then when, come, when hard times come, then you use debt. So you do both. And it, it, you can start out with a dollar. It's 50 cents to save you, 50 cents to invest. And you, you, you have to do both. Um, and, and then if you do that, you can send your kid to college without any debt if you start when they are first born. I mean, how many cars do we own in our lifetime? Most, the average American owns anywhere from three to four
for cars in their lifetime. The average price of a car these days is about $28,000. If you cut that car down to one and a half or just keep it for 10 or 15 years, you've already saved half of the cost, uh, or at least a year worth of tuition for your child. So it really starts in your home. The financial literacy, it's great to have these community programs, but it really does start in your home. You are the only ones that can teach your children financial values. We teach our children to tie. I'm not gonna go to a financial literacy program necessarily that's gonna teach that to my child. And so it has to start there. If you have an education program for your students, you ought to have a program for their parents. Because that information is not gonna stick if the parents aren't there to enforce it. So it's a marriage of both. And, and as you leave here, just think about how you handle your own money. In a room like this size, probably half of you are living beyond your paycheck. So just start there and then then you can support these kind of programs and, and we will all be in a better position financially. We can send our kids to Bennett without any debt. They can own their businesses and we would all be better. In closing, we're gonna get ready to wrap this up. Uh, in closing. <laughs> we, um, I, I, I just wanna say this. It, it, it's been an honor to, to moderate this panel. And these panelists are great. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.